Hi, this is Geshe Michael uh, with our next installment of Learning Tibetan, Learning to be a Translator of Ancient Tibetan. And uh, we've been talking about the different uh, letters of the Tibetan alphabet. We've covered all the vowels. We've covered the mostly silent prefix letters. We've covered head letters. Um, we've covered the subjoin letters. We've covered the suffix letters that come after the sound, that close the sound. So having covered ngun juk, which means the prefix letters, ngun means before, juk means applied. Uh, we've covered the gen juk, which means applied after, so j means after. We're going to cover tonight uh, yang juk. So yang juk means uh, secondary suffix letter. Let's give an example. And there are only two of them, so it's not it's not a big subject. Uh, if we take this word here, so can you pronounce that for me? Uh, Rik. Rik, okay, with a ra, right? Rik. Uh, it's spelled out loud, C A T cat, it would be ra, giku, ri, say ra, ra. giku, giku. Ri. ri, ka, ka. rik. So here, uh, ka is the primary suffix letter, the first suffix letter. Uh, in order to get a change in meaning, uh, another suffix letter can be added. And one of the two, which is allowed, is a sa. So pronounce this for me. Rik, same, same pronunciation, OK? These two are homonyms. They're pronounced the same. If you're spelling out loud, uh, you s if you're jorlok, you say ragikuri kasa rik. So you don't say ragikuri rik sa rik. You don't say it that way. You 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 say ragikuri kasa rik. Okay, and that changes the meaning. Any idea about the meaning of either one of these? Rikpa. Rikpa meaning mind, the mind. Okay, sousing your rikpa shape it's any part of the definition of the mind. And Rik with an S means type or class or family, like Rignar, the Buddhas of the five families. Okay, so this becomes a, a totally different word meaning class. Okay, with the with the secondary suffix letter, the secondary suffix letters are Sil silent. Okay, you don't hear them. All right, something you should know about this combination of Ka and Sa is that in a in a woodblock carving, if they run out of space at the end of the piece of wood, they, they're allowed to shorten that combination of ka-sa to this, okay, which is a backwards ta. Okay? So ragikuri uh, ka-sa rik, can, it can be carved this way and it's a rik. It's the same thing. Okay? And you just have to know that. When you come to a, a backwards D, uh, at, the, at the end of a block, a wood block, uh, then it, it might be kasa. Also, there are some wood blocks like the monastic textbooks of Tashin Lumbo Monastery, which are purposely carved strange to thwart other monasteries who might want to steal their books. Uh, so they will have many of these abbreviations you'll find in books like that. So you should know that this is a proper way of studying, of showing this. We have Kanga Dana Bama Aralasa. Kanga Dana Bama Aralasa. Ten suffix letters. And a good number can take a secondary sa. For example, if we take this verb, And by the way, the dot is required after only this letter, no, so you don't mistake it for a ka. Uh, pronounce this. Sum. Sum, okay. Jorlog. Kao. Kao means prefix ka. Sa. Shabkyu. Su. Nga. Sum. Okay. And that means? Say. To say, okay. Uh, he is talking to me in a Koran Sungudur. He's telling me that, okay. Koran Sungudur. Now, if we add a secondary suffix, sa, yangjuk, uh, uh, let's, let's pronounce it first. Sung. Sung. These are har homonyms. Secondary suffix letters don't change the pronunciation at all. They're only for orthographic purposes. Change the meaning by spelling, changing the spelling. 
uh, and then this would be spelled out loud, Kao Sa Shabkyu Su Nga Sa Sung, Nga Sa Sung. So you don't say Kao Sa Shabkyu Su Nga Sa Sung, you say Kao Shabkyu Su Nga Sa Sung, okay? You don't say Kao Shabkyu Su Nga Sung Sa Sung, okay? You don't say that. Um, now, if you say, uh, I don't know, mm, let's take the, the verb create, okay? In, in English, what do you use for the third person singular present tense? He creates, creates s, and you add an s. How do you indicate the past tense? Yeah, ed is, is often used in English for the past tense. When you add a, this suffix letter, d, in English, the verb often changes to past tense. When you add a secondary suffix letter to a Tibetan verb, it almost always indicates a past tense, okay? So tenses are not very well defined in Tibetan, okay? And after a certain century, they're pretty ignored anyway. You have to guess the tense from the context. But if you see a secondary suffix letter on a verb, you can pretty much count that it's a past tense, okay? So that covers the first of the two young jukes, the first of the two secondary suffix letters. No change in pronunciation, sometimes a radical change in meaning, and oftentimes a uh, changing of a present tense verb to a past tense verb. And those are the uses of sa, okay? And just be aware of this special character used for kasa when we're running out of space. Uh, now we're going to cover the, secondar the second secondary suffix letter, which is ta. And uh, I'll give you an example. Mm, I wrote some examples for you. Mm, okay. So let's let's jorlope this. Let's spell it out loud. Ao, nga. Okay. You already indicate the prenasal. This is one of the two prefix letters that can make a prenasal out of a third column. Ao, nga, yata, nya, shapyu, ngu, ra, ngur. Okay. Present tense of the verb to become. Very very important verb in in Tibetan to become. Okay. A uh, different spelling means to translate or to exchange money, gyur, pao sagata gayata gyashab gyura gyur, which means to exchange. Uh, but the obviously the same root, okay, to change or to become. And then we have the kangyur, which is the translated word of the Buddha, kangyur, okay. Uh, let's go to the past tense of this verb, which simply drops the simply drops the prefix letter, okay? And that's pretty common. Uh, someday we'll get into tenses, okay? And we're not going to do it tonight. But this changes from a prenasal to a, just a normal third column. So it goes from ngyur to kyur. Di chepan gyur means he will be doing it. Di chepan kyur means he did it, okay? Kyur. Say kyur. Ngyur. Kyur. Mm -yur. Mm -yur. Okay. Now we had uh, termination particles. Kongo dono bomo o rolo soto. Okay. Kongo dono bomo o rolo soto. There are only 10 suffix letters, so there should be only 10 terminative par particles. I'll give you an example. If you want to say, he will become and then you want to stop the sentence in a big way. Not all sentences have this, but this terminative particle is a, is a strong stop, okay, like a section stop or something like that. So Tibetan doesn't have periods. They have no way to indicate the end of a sentence. You just have to translate it according to your feeling of the meaning. But if you see a row, that means a, a definite stop, and, you sh and that's normally the end of a sentence or even a whole section. So the terminative particle for, for ngyur is ro. And there are, let's say so far we have 10 choices. 
ko lo do no bo mo o ro lo so. Okay, ten choices. How do you determine which one of the ten you use after a specific after any selected word? Yeah, you look at the suffix. The last letter here will match the letter of the terminative particle. If this had been the past tense of to say, which is sung s, it would have been sung so. Good. Who said that? Good. Sung so. Okay, and that's very common. Okay, sung so gyuro. Now. There's a problem, all right? We will often see in scripture this combination. Sorry, Kyur. To, say Kyur to. Kyur to, he became, period. Okay, he became, past tense, period. Kyur to. Why isn't it Kyur o? There, okay. There's a, there's a, what do you call it? Vestigial yeah. thing that dropped out of the language. Okay, there was a secondary suffix here. What was it? Is the second ser secondary suffix letter. So if you see some very old manuscripts like the ones that come from uh, Dunhuang in Tibetan, you might see the ancient spelling, which is cured. Okay, ending with a secondary suffix da. Okay, they are the only way we know they are there. We the only way we know they were there in modern literature is because of the to. Okay, and why it wasn't do, I don't know. Maybe this got harder, or maybe it used to be da. I don't know. But you will see impossible termination particles after the wrong letter. This should have been cure ro. This should match this letter, but it's cure to. And the explanation is that there used to be a secondary suffix letter, da, okay? And it's, it's easy to remember because it's very similar to ed, and it means past, past tense. Perfect participle, past tense, very past tense, okay? So kyurto means he became, period, okay? How do we know there used to be a d there? Because of the terminative particle that's used after it, okay? Uh, now, later writers get sloppy, and you might see something like this is the present tense of a verb. Zin, what's it mean, zin? To hold. To hold, all right? Zimba, right? To hold, zin. The past tense changes, but it's obviously related. It's sin. Okay? And in fact, uh, the word sin can be a past participle indicator. Uh, ko means he already finished it. So it's a, it's a strong ed. Sin means it's done, it's finished, it's held. Okay? So uh, sin can be the past perfect indicator in if they want to make it strong. Like he already went to Joshinsha. Joshinsha means he finished. He, he went already. It's gone. It's already done. Okay, sin. Now, this being the past tense, uh, there is a secondary da which is not visible, right? In the written language you'll never see it. It's it's invisible. This is all always in the scriptures like sin, okay? Unless it's very, very old, okay, uh, the carving, you will only see sin, okay. So then, the what should be the terminative particle after sin? Oh. Yeah, it should always be do because sin is already what? It's already past tense, okay. This is the present tense. When the za changes to sa, it's past tense, okay. That's always past tense. Now you tell me whether this is legal to end a sentence with sino. This is the correct spelling. It should be always sinto. But in the last, I don't know, 500 years, 
Tibetans forgot, many Tibetans didn't know about this secondary suffix, and they would say Sino. So if you do a search of the database, the, the ACIP library, you will see a lot of Sinos, and they will mostly be later writers, okay? The early writers knew there was an invisible da there, and, and then occasionally you'll see lists of verb tenses, and they'll add the secondary da in the past tenses just to show you, okay? So we've completed the two yangjuk, yangjuk, which means secondary suffix. Letters. Yang means again, right? Juk means applied again, meaning a secondary uh, suffix letter. One is visible, which is sa. sa. And it's pretty common after ka, nga, pa, ma. Like, you know lam rim, right? That rim means what? A step or a stage, marga, right? Add a sa to it, and it becomes the plague. A plague. The plague, okay? So you have to know your suffix letters, okay? Uh, and then this one is a sa, is a Da is a secondary suffix letter in the ancient language and only deduced by the presence of to in, in modern manuscripts, okay? And that way you'll know that it's there, that it was there, okay? Any questions? Okay, that completes the secondary suffix letters. I believe we have covered everything you need to know to pronounce a Tibetan syllable correctly. What's cool about Tibetan syllables is that in almost all cases, with very rare exceptions, when you see it on the paper, you can pronounce it correctly. It's not like English, where there could be different pronunciations of the word that you, you have to have heard it before. Uh, with all the classes up to this one, and, and having finished this one, you can pronounce anything in the Tibetan language correctly, okay? except for weird exceptions, like Dorjade, like that R shouldn't be pronounced. Okay? There's one exception to saying that now you can read anything in the Tibetan language correctly, which is Sanskrit written with Tibetan letters. Okay? Sanskrit written in Tibetan letters uh, misbehaves completely, and impossible things are possible. So in our next class, we'll just, do a, we'll just go and taste uh, Sanskrit written in Tibetan letters. To give a whole course about that would take a whole course. But I'll give you uh, a couple of examples of Tibetan, writ sorry, Sanskrit written in Tibetan letters. Sanskrit transcribed with Tibetan. I think Coptic is like that. Um, it's uh, Egyptian written in Greek letters or something like that. Uh, and, and this is also, we're going to have some weird things, weird impossible things can happen. And all the rules of pronunciation that you've learned so far collapse uh, when you talk about Sanskrit. So in our next class, we'll do a little bit of Sanskrit for fun. Thank you.